Hello? Now, good day to you out there. As impressed upon me by God, there is this message that has to be delivered. And the last time we spoke about what we should avoid while we're on online. Because there are certain persons who come online to teach error. And sometimes it has become difficult for us to identify a false preacher. Especially if there are people we have been familiar with before. Or there have been people that have been within our congregation or church. And so when they teach a little of error, a little of truth, we do not find it easy to separate the little poison of error they are putting into their message. And some of us prefer alliance to friendship than alliance to the old truth. That even when they are going off track, we do not in love drop them back. But I need you to know that we would rather stand for God than stand with friends or family when it comes to the word of God. Now today, this message is to the world, the church world as a whole. And the church world I'm talking to is not limited to a denomination. The Lord sent this message to every child of God in every part of the world. What's the title? It's titled, Life and Death. Life and Death. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, if you read from verse 1, you will see it says, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Listen, it is the Lord that planted us on earth. So sometimes, when we think it's not due time in our own human calculation and calendar, God says it's due time for you to come home. And so, of recent, we have heard of maybe somebody there died, another person there died, and it happens to be maybe a child of God or a minister of the gospel. You may have questions in your mind. Listen, I have questions too, but the Lord's answer is superior to all. The point is, there is a time to be born, and there is a time to die. Now, but I've seen some misguided persons online making misguided statements about the life and death of a believer. Some say, why should a child of God die? Well, God has his time. Some say, we know he is dying or he died because God determined it to be so even before he was born. That may not necessarily be so. There are several reasons why a person may die. It may be Reasons we may not be able to address at this point. Maybe in the next video we will address that. But today, I want to zero in on this. To say that some of us are fond of making careless statements about the dead or about who has died. Some other times we have seen people that just talk out of empty theory. People who have neither experienced people dying close to them. Now, you know, like somebody said, there are people in this world, when you see a dead man, they carry a dead man beside you. To you, it may look like a log of wood until when that dead person you to identify is one of a relative. It is when that person is close to you, you will really know what it means to lose a lost one. So, passing comments about the dead, especially negative comments, or some comments that are not scripturally based, let's be careful. Especially people that are maybe sanguine or extrovert that just pass out comments. You have never experienced it. You don't know what it means to lose a child. You don't know what it means to lose a wife or a husband. You don't know what it means to leave somebody that you sleep together, eat together, live together for years. And you just open your mouth and pass comments about what you know leads you or nothing about. Let's be careful. Some of the things we pass comments about, if we are not careful, God will make you experience it before you know. And so be careful in passing comments. You know, you see, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you read that place, the apostle was speaking about what he has gone through. And he says, before I pass a comment, I can tell you I'm passing the comment from my comfort. That is, I've gone through it. He's saying that. 
And so he's saying, from what he, is, he has gone through, he can say, from the stand view of an experienced person, that this is, what it, this is what it means and what it entails to lose a very dear loved one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 4, he said, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Listen. You know, if we are alive and well, it's because of the mercy of God. And so, be careful of the comments you pass. And then he said, the God of all comfort, you see. There is no comfort we can give to others that is good enough except the one that comes from the Lord. And so, before you go to the bereaved person, before you go to a challenged person, let it be that God has given you a word. Because it's only the word from the Lord that can comfort the bereaved or comforts the challenge. It says, the God of all comfort. And so, your word, as sweet as it may be, may just be mere theory that may not lift the soul or live the life. Look at Job chapter 42. Job, after going through all that he went through, he said something that challenged me. Job 42. Look at verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the hear. What he's saying is this. Before now, I've heard about God. We could also say, before now, I've preached about God. But until when he experienced certain things, look at what he said at the end part of that verse, Job 42 verse Verse 4, the ending part, I and then verse 5 rather. But now my eye sees thee. What is Job saying? When he has gone through the challenges of this life, he can now say, My eye sees thee. Until when you go through it, you never will know how it feels to be in. That's why sometimes I don't like people saying, I know how you feel. The word I know how you feel, you may mean well, but the point is, you really do not know how that person is feeling because you are not in it. All, so you know, someone said, somebody that is not wearing your shoe, he is telling you how to tie your shoelace. And he has never bought that kind of shoe before. He has never used that kind of shoe before. He is not involved in that kind of shoe. He is not even selling that kind of shoe. And he's here prescribing how to tie your shoelace. And he's not wearing your shoe. That's how some people just pass comments about this, about that. When they have not been through it. Or they don't even know, they are, not, they, they are not in the experience, and they have not gone through the experience, and they are not even, in, the, in their mindset, they are just pumping up a, an empty theory, like I say. Empty theory. Look at Luke chapter 7. This is a message, and it's a warning, both for believers and to unbelievers. And then as we go deep into it, please follow me too, because just, this is just introduction to what I'm saying. Luke chapter 7. Luke 7, I read verse 19. Luke 7, verse 19. It says, And John calling unto calling, and John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Now, here is John the Baptist. He sent two of his disciples to Jesus. Look at what he said. Are thou he that should come? Or look we for another? Have you taken time to look at this verse? That John the Baptist who was the prophet and the man that God used as the forerunner of Jesus Christ. In fact, he was the one that introduced the ministry of Jesus Christ. He was the one that pointed at the Lamb and said, This, Jesus, is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. Now, the same John, in his time of trial, when he was in prison, here ever that loved him up, he's about to be killed. He is here saying, Jesus, let's find out from you. Are you the Christ, or would you look for another? Have you observed that? It means this, that in difficult moments, when, only when you go through it, before you know who you are, that thing shook John so much and shook the foundation of his faith, that he began to question and query some of the prophecies he has made. That is how we are. Sometimes we think we have gotten over it. It's just, for example, that if somebody just loses a loved one, for the first two days, they may live in denial. Eventually, they got to a point where they have accepted it, and then they, because we are believers, we have someone of courage, and we say some very positive statement. It's very fantastic. That is good to encourage us and encourage people around us. But the point is this. From scriptural experience and from personal experience, I can tell that some weeks from now, some months from now, or maybe some years from now, the reality will be done, and the vacuum will be felt. And that is why we keep praying. For those that are passing through those circumstances, because from weeks from now, some of what they have even said now that look like encouraging statements, 
they may begin to sound like, are you relent? Are you relenting? Are you going back? Are they tracking back? Because the reality of life dawns on them, and that's exactly how we are. Look at it again. It says, John now says, are you the Christ, or do we look for another? And so, warning number one: be careful of the comments you pass about those going through tough times. Be careful about the comments you pass about those that have maybe lost a loved one or lost a believer or lost whoever they have lost. Be careful about the comment. Point number two, and warning number two is this: that this person that he seemed to be courageous at the point that he lost love either his wife or his husband or his children or his family, please know. That even at this period of courage is expressing his courage, he's standing firm, there will be time soon, some weeks from now, some months from now, that the vacuum will become so visible and begins to be a kind of challenge. And seems like he's feeling it down. And so the message is number two is this let's keep praying, let's keep encouraging. Let's keep challenging those that are maybe sounding strong now. Keep praying because the strength you are seeing. There will be a time it will be challenged. And that's what happened to John here. He was now querying and questioning, is Jesus the Messiah or do we look for another? Now, going further, I've also seen people online, especially with the death of a man of God recently who was just about 42 years. And they are teaching people that they should not think of long life. That long life is not part of what God gave us. In fact, they said that God has predetermined that so-so person will die at so-so time. Now, let's take it first general and then make it personal. The general expectation of God for all of his children, all creatures of God, we see that somebody should have 20, somebody should have 50, somebody should have 60. Let's see. In Psalm 90, before you pass comment and teach people well, that is not based on the generality of the scripture, please be careful what you teach. I have seen people teach what they don't themselves even understand. Look at Psalm 90. In Psalm 90 verse 10, it says, The days of our years, generally, are three scores and ten. It said three scores, that's three times twenty, that's sixty, and ten. Sixty plus ten, that's seventy. What God is saying is this. Generally, the days of our years should be at least seventy years. It means that before you teach people and say, don't expect to live up to seventy years. You are teaching error. You need to know that. that you are teaching damnation. The Bible says normally, Generally, the days of our years are three scores and ten. And if by reason of strength there be four scores, that is for 80 years. So normally you should be able to live normally 70 years, 80 years and above. That's the average age that God, through prophet Moses here, gave as the average age of every man and woman before departure from the head. So we should normally expect to live as long as 70 years. We should normally expect to live as long as 80 years. But then, there are special cases where somebody, according to God's plan, maybe he has completed his work. And that we cannot generalize. That we cannot generalize and say, oh, we, you should also be expecting to die at 20. You shouldn't be expecting to die at 20. You know what we say? We don't prepare for, we don't expect to die prematurely. That shouldn't be our expectation. We should be open and praying to live long life and healthy life. And so, like people say, look at the scripture. Even in the New Testament, there was this disciple, uh, James. He died earlier. That was not general. Peter lived longer. John lived longer. In fact, all the other disciples lived longer. We also have a Stephen, who was killed and was persecuted. Eventually, he died. He died long, younger. But there are many who lived longer. What we're saying is this. Don't try to indoctrinate people with the the, the, the perception of don't expect to live long in Rome. And there are people that teach that for several reasons. Maybe somebody around them died so soon in life. And so they begin to say, oh, if these can die this way, don't expect long life. No, we can expect long life. We should believe in long life. We should pray for long life. We should walk towards long life. We should live healthy life expecting long life. And so don't teach people and make them feel like, oh, you should be expecting to die tomorrow. It shouldn't be the way. It shouldn't be the normal thing. The normal thing is that here the apostle, here the disciple, majority had a long life and good health that God has promised us. And so that should be clarified. Look at Psalm 91 verse 10. He said, with long life will this satisfy me. That should be our expectation. That should be what we believe in. It should not be because you have a challenge 
or because you have a sickness that may take your life so soon, or you assume we, and so you are telling people to also expect that. Or expect, we don't make our personal experience or personal expectation generalized for the people of God and try to impose that on them. The normal thing the Bible said is that Psalm 90 verse 10, we are supposed to live long and healthy life, and which is to be averagely 70 years. But let me say this now. We don't pray to die young. And so don't teach people that they should be expecting to die young. We should plan to live long. Because in Psalm 91, Psalm 91 verse 10, verse 16, like that, with long life will it satisfy me? And that should be our expectation. That we should not be praying or expecting to die long, young just because some people died around you. We should not also plan to die young. We should plan to live long. But then, why would you not pray to die long? Why we plan to live long? We should be prepared for our eternity at any time. We should be prepared for our eternity at any time. And so, that balance that off. But let me say three things now. You see, death can be in three form. Because the reality is, death is a reality. But we leave this world either by death or by the rapture. It is not all that will die. Because some will be alive when Jesus will come in the rapture. But then for those that will die before the rapture, there are three forms of death. One, there is sudden death without sickness. Sudden death without sickness. There are some that will not have any visible sign of any sickness in them and suddenly they die. And so before you teach people and tell them that you may die at any time, you should know that it's not all who die who are sick. And so when you also see somebody that you suddenly say, oh, he must have been sick before. It's not necessarily so. There are people who die who have no sickness, but God decided to call them home. God said, it's time for, for you to leave. Number two, there is instant death through accident. There is instant death through accident. Now this one, nobody prays for it, but it happens. There are people that may be engaged in some accident, maybe auto accident, maybe by flight, maybe on the boat, maybe even domestic accident, and suddenly they die. And then we, we, we just pray that anytime the Lord calls us home, we'll be prepared to meet him in Jesus' name. But then the third point is this. There are gradual deaths. Now, these people that die gradually, let me explain that. Somebody that was sick and was on the bed and was bedridden, we don't pray for it, but it happens. He was sick or she was sick for one month, six months, some people one year, two years, three years, or four years, or five years, eventually they pass away. Now, you see, even though it seems to be painful death, for someone to be sick and eventually die, but do you know something? That period of sickness, one month, six months, three months, gives them the opportunity to prepare. Gives them the opportunity to be thoughtful about their lives. Give them the opportunity to make right their lives. Give them the opportunity to pray for healing. They didn't get it, but they keep expecting and preparing. So it is not sudden any longer. And so such people may make some statements on their sick bed that will show you that they are looking forward to leave the world. Maybe the pain is too much. Maybe the expectation now is to get to heaven. And so, either it is sudden death without sickness, or instant death through accident, or gradual death after prolonged illnesses. The point is, one day, if not by the rapture, men will die. And you know, we need to also know that if you want to counsel, because now I want to get to this other part. When you want to counsel people that are believed, there are three factors I need you to know. If not, if you've been through it, or the Lord has taught you about it, please listen to this. In First, Second Corinthians chapter one, look at the statement of Apostle Paul to the Holy Ghost. He says, "We that are comforted, we go and comfort others." Look at it in verse four. First Corinthians chapter, Second Corinthians chapter one, verse four. Who comforted us? That means I've been in a situation that I needed comfort. I was comforted. Who comforted us in all our tribulation? 
that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. What does that mean? It's because I've gone through the trouble myself and I was comforted. So I'm in a good situation to comfort those that are in that situation now. It means some of the reason why we've passed through difficult time in life is because we will overcome so we can counsel, we can comfort, we can console those that will be in that situation later in life. So if you are going through a difficult time, or you lost a child, or you lost a wife, or you lost an husband, or you lost a sibling, rather than regretting and sorrowing, can we do something? Know that God has a reason for what he has allowed. Yes, it's not everything that happened that God does. Some people say, it is God that took him away. It may not even be God. Look at Job. The children die. It wasn't God that killed them. God allowed it so. It means God can do some things, but some other times God allows certain things. It was the devil doing all that. Job was wasting in time thinking it was God, but it wasn't God. God allowed it, but God didn't do it. So there are things that God allowed so painful, but he didn't do it. That's why we say that there are things God could allow in his wisdom, although he could have prevented them in his power. He has his reason. And he has an ultimate goal. He could even use that to do more souls to the Lord. Now, if you have been in a state of difficulty, believed, challenged, sick, down, depressed, please see it that God has the reason. That he wants you in the nearest future to be a comfort, to be a blessing, to be a benefit to those that will soon later be in that circumstance. Look at it. Who comforted us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we, we ourselves are comforted by God. Now that is why I tell people, if you have not gone through something, stop passing careless comments. If you are not wearing the shoe, stop teaching us how to lace the shoe. If you don't know how the, color, the coloration of the shoe is, you have no information about the shoe, you are just passing comments. Even some people are good at preaching. Good at teaching, good at instructing, but on the when the things slack them and their family, but they don't know. And so please be careful of the comments. It says, We were comforted. And so let those that have the garment of experience, let them talk first before you talk. Let them not those that who have gone through it and can say, This is what I've been. Let them talk first before you talk. You've not been through it, don't go and pack the paper theory. I learned it, I learned it. It is not enough to learn. Through theory and paper. It's not even enough to learn through observation. you got to learn. Look at what Job, Job said. I have heard of you. At the end of his affliction, I only heard of you before. But now I have seen you. After he has gone through it, he said, I have seen you. Until when you go through it before, you can see certain things. John the Baptist, until when he went through, he never knew that he would doubt Jesus being the Lord. He then was saying, Jesus, are you the one or we should look for another? He could talk boldly before he hears the Lamb of God. But when he went through the, 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 the stuff and he was down in the prison, he was about to be beheaded by Herod. He cried out, are you the one or we should look for another? When you have not, what you have not been through, don't pass careless comments on. You don't know the shoe. You don't wear the shoe. You didn't learn about the shoe. You don't have understanding of the shoe. So before you throw your comment and start throwing comment to people, be careful that you are not passing on due comment. And so, three things to say about those of us that want to comfort the bereaved, or comfort the challenge, or comfort the trouble. One, when you counsel people, the bereaved people in particular, go with number one, the expression of the lost consolation. Go with the expression of the lost consolation. Let it be that what you are saying is the Lord cons that, has, that has consoled a word of cons consolation from the Lord. Be sure is a word of consolation from the Lord. An expression of the Lord's consolation. Let's see that God gives you the word. Some of us are too rash to speak. We hear somebody going through something. You just want to talk. You want to make comment. You want to pass comment. What you don't know about. What you have not been through. The shoe you are not wearing. The color of the shoe you are not. You are not. You, you are not so involved in. Let it be. That you go with the expression of the lost consolation, number two. When you want to comfort the believer or a challenged person, number two, let it go that you go with the expression of an informed, comforted comforter. 
go with the expression with the experience the experience of an informed comforted comforter let it be that number one you have some level of experience about what you're talking about let it be that you yourself you have been comforted about what you are just jumping into making conclusion and then you can be in a good place to comfort the person around you go with the experience of an informed comforted comforter number three when you go cancer, when you go comfort the belief, what do you do? You go with the expectation of the belief family. Go with the expectation of the belief family. What, what do I mean by that? You see? The belief family do not want you to be telling them that it is God that took away your, your husband. Just lastly. Say it in a pleasant way. You can pass that comment, but pass it in a pleasant way. Let it be that you know what you are saying, what they want to know. That God, though God allowed it, but God can comfort you. Though God has permitted this, but God that can stand in you. Go with the expression of the belief family. Let it be comfort is coming from you. Some encouragement is coming from you. Some, uh, some standing beside them is coming from you. Now, in conclusion, as we talk about life and death, you see, death is, one, a lesson for the living. Some of us see death as intimidating. And we live in a day, on in days, where believers, very many people that call themselves Christian, are afraid of death. When they hear about death, they are afraid. When they hear about the rapture, they are afraid. When they hear about the great tribulation, they are afraid. Why? Many people are not prepared for the eternity. What kind of Christianity are we doing? Look at it. Death is a lesson for the living. Romans chapter 11, I mean, Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die. It's the reality. You must be prepared for death. You must be prepared for your eternity. The lesson for the living. You will die one day. Either we die or we are gone in the rapture. If Jesus does not come in the nearest future, if he delays a little longer, we don't know when he will come. How do we not know when he will come? He didn't tell us. He said, only the Father knows. And so whoever is predicting the date of Jesus coming is a liar. He says, only the Father knows. Why has he not come? Have I said something before? Let me say it here again. You see, between the time Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, that the coming of Jesus was predicted, he said, I will send the son, he will bruise the head of the serpent, and that's what bruise with you. Genesis chapter 3 and Matthew, when he eventually came. Do you know there were thousands and thousands of years between the prophecy of his first coming and his eventual coming in his birth in Bethlehem? The point I'm making is this. Between the time the coming of the first coming was predicted and when it came, thousands of years, thousands, not just two, not just three thousand, thousands of years took place before he eventually came. Now, between this time that he left and the time he will come again, According to calculation, they said we have just spent about 2,000 years plus. So let's say, let's even say roughly 2,000, 3,000 years. And we say he has delayed his coming. The point I'm making is this. If it took him thousands of years to come to rescue us from sin, now that he has died, he wants as many people as possible to be saved. So if he has taken 2,000 years and you say he is delaying too long, he didn't delay too long. He's waiting for somebody out there. But will he delay forever? Not at all. But the point I'm making is this. Let's stop making the assumption that he has delayed. He has never delayed. It will come when he will come. He said, he that will come shall come. And so, between now and then, let's learn this lesson. That, number one, life is short. You may live 90 years, it's still short. You may live 100 years, it's still short. You may live 70 years, it's still short. Life is short. And like I said earlier in Psalm 90 verse 10, the average year that the Lord has prophesied according to, from the mouth of the prophet Moses that men should live is 70 years. So don't expect to die young. But it can happen. But the point is, life is short. Number two, eternity is sure. We won't live here forever. After the world, there is a place we will spend eternity. Eternity is sure. Number three, live daily with eternity in view. Live daily with eternity in view. That's the lesson from the living. 
for the living. When we see death, that's the lesson. The lesson for the living, life is short, eternity is sure, live daily with eternity in view. Number two, a reason for the departed. See, learning from death, three lessons from death here. A reason for the departed. Is there any reason God has for the person that has departed and has left us? Yes. There is a reason. Look at Revelation chapter 14. God says, if a man dies and is gone, a woman dies and she is gone, I have a reason. Revelation chapter 14 verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. It says, the reason why I call this person home is to rest from his labor. The reason why I call this, uh, this other person's home is to rest from her labor. And their works do follow them. Can we simplify this verse by saying that, number one, if you see a man die, particularly a believer, a child of God, he dies, number one, to be with God. He dies to be with God. We are serving God on earth. But one day we will see God. Number two, to have our reward. That's why it says, their labor do follow them. Their works do follow them. So we are going to be rewarded. To be rewarded. To have their reward. So rather than cry over wisdom, rejoice if he is in Christ. But we must warn ourselves that we realize that maybe at the better ground or after someone dies, we tell many lies. I will explain what I mean. There are people who dies, we think they have gone to heaven. But the truth is, they've not gone to heaven. Some of, it, some of them. Only God knows. And so at the better ground, some of the statements were passed. They are good. We may be encouraging each other. But only the Lord knows who has gone there. Because you do not know the secrets of the heart. Because you do not know the thing the person did. Because you do not know the center of his thought at the point of death. Neither do you even know his secret action or a secret action at the point of death. That's why we say number three, the reason for the living of the departed to face their judgment. To face their judgment. And so, these are reasons for the departed. Let me round up by saying this. Number three, a concern for the left behind. You see what I said? Message from death, a lesson for the living. Message from death, a reason for the living, for the departed. Message from death, a concern for the left behind. When you see a man die or a woman die and they are gone, we should be concerned for those that they left behind. And like I said earlier, you will see that at the point of the belief family, at the point of maybe barrier or before barrier, a little after barrier, they seem very strong and courageous. They may pass some comments that may be very challenging and encouraging. Some of us hold those comments and then go to sleep without praying for them. And assume, oh, that pastor is very strong. That sister is very strong. That man is very strong. He is taking it in good faith. Yes, he and she is taking it in good faith. But when some days, some weeks, some months, some years, the vacuum left behind becomes more visibly felt, they begin to have feeling of discouragement, some depression, some being left behind, some feeling so down and low. And that is why we should be concerned for those that are left behind. We should not pity them. You see the busy family, they don't need our pity. They need our prayer. Pray for them. Rather than pity them, pray for them. Number two. Rather than scold them, support them. Don't scold them. See why he died. See what he didn't do right. See what? Don't scold them. Support them. Rather than condemn them, the busy family are finding fault. Uh, you know, particularly if the person was sick before. And then after prolonged sickness, maybe you are aware of it, of the sickness. And then you begin to find the reason. See, it's because you didn't go to this hospital. It's because you didn't use this drugs. It's because you didn't... all those kind of unnecessary comments are not needed now. Don't condemn the action or in inactions. Just comfort them. We and then we should not be quick to speak to them. 
to the bereaved family, to the troubled family, to the challenged family. We should not be too quick to speak. We should be slow to speak. Ensure that the Holy Ghost put a word in your, in, in, in your mouth before you speak to them. Let it be word of comfort. Word of comfort. And as we do this, the Almighty God, you know, for those of us that see come online, talk about this, talk about that, teach people error. Things you don't know. Things you've not been through. Just passing comments. Just throwing comments. You have never, I, I, I sometimes, I, I've seen some of them online. You have never lost a wife. You have never lost an husband. You didn't lose your father at the point you needed him. You didn't lose your wife. You don't, you, have not even know, you don't even know what it means to be around that thing. But you open your mouth and just teach things. And just throw this. Talk is cheap. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, every careless word that preachers shall speak, they shall give account thereon in the day of judgment. Let's be careful what we say. What do we do? The people that are believed, the people that are challenged, the people that are in trouble at the moment, what do we do to them? Matthew chapter 25, before we pray. Matthew chapter 25. I read from verse 34. It says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hunger, and you gave me meat. You see them, give them some meat. I was a stranger. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. Give them some drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. You see the man has lost his wife. Or you see the woman has lost her husband. You see the child has lost the parent. Take them in and help them. And then he said, Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer and say, Lord, when saw we thee and hunger and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee, then we then when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, and or naked and clothed thee, or when saw we thee sick, or in prison and came unto thee, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, in so much as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So what do we do? The bereaved, the challenge, the sick, the orphan, the widow, even the widow. Some of us neglect widowers. I will explain. We take care of the widow. The widow has lost her husband. And so we run around them with sin to her, but we neglect widowers. The man is a man. He will take care of himself. Of himself. You don't know that some of these widowers go into depression. He's a man. He has money. You think everything is money? And some of them, he not even have the money. Maybe in the midst of his wife being sick for several years, he lost his job. He lost his finance. He lost his connection. And you don't care. He's a widower. It doesn't matter. He will, he will rise. And you left him in that condition. Why well, should have taken him maybe six months to rise again? It's now taking him two years, four years. Five years to rise. So as we care for the widow, consider widowers too. He wants. You, can you encourage him to be remarried? Can you encourage her to? And that, this is a point. There are some widows that lost their wife, their husband, rather. And some men out there, they want to get married. You are only. And I must point this out because God has impressed this on me for quite a while. Some men in the church, when they want to get married. Even at 40 years, they are only looking for a, woman, a lady of 20, 21, 22, 20. I want a young lady. That's the only concern. They run after the young. They abandon. There are widowers that can be remarried. We leave the widows, nobody to marry them. And then even a widower, God led him to a widow. He abandons her. And then maybe, maybe even the man. It may not even be a widower, but you are you, you, you are in your 40s, you are in your 50s, and there is a widow of 20, 25, a widow of 35, and you say, no, I'm not interested. I want a girl of 20. I want a girl of 22. You are looking for what they call fresh blood. I don't know what the issue. Worldliness and self-centeredness. And there are several widows who are uncared for. But there are several widows who are married. There are several widows who can be considered, and the men of today are running after the small, small ones. 
and some of those small small ones themselves once they get money they begin to carry their their weight up and bigger than everybody now you see my my past my husband is a pastor of that church because a man of 40 years married a, 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 a lady of 25 years and then she became i'm now older than the old one that shouldn't be there should be humility in every relationship now the point in conclusion is this those of you teaching people Errors on Facebook because somebody died or somebody lost his life or lost his wife or lost his husband or lost a person. Please know that the Bible in Luke in Psalm 9010 tells us that the average age a person should live is normally 70 years or 80 years and above. But then if for any reason anybody goes beyond before that time, encourage them. See readings to cancel them. And stop teaching people to not to expect long life like some of you are teaching. And then we that they should plan to die now as if God did not have any prophecy, any blessing, any provision of for us to live long life. Psalm 91, verse 16. With long life will it satisfy you? With long life will it satisfy me? And our families we will enjoy long life in the name of Jesus. Let's close our eyes and pray. I want you to begin to pray and ask God. If you are part of those who make careless statements, make comment about what you don't know. Make comment about what either you have not been through or you are not in it. That God will help you and help us to repent of our idle words. And that from tonight, from today, we'll be careful about what we say and careful about how we say things. And that in passing our message, Yes, we will pass the truth, but we will pass it in love. And we will not be pompous. We will not be proud. We will put ourselves in the shoes of others. We will see, try to see how do you want to be addressed, assuming you are in their condition. How do you like to be comforted? And for the men of God or the women of God, or the children of God or the people of God, who are believed now, that are looking strong and sounding strong, let's not leave them. Let's be close to them. Let's keep praying for them. And God of all comfort will comfort the bereaved family, bereaved wife, bereaved husband, bereaved children, bereaved siblings, bereaved souls, in the name of Jesus. I pray for you, I pray for myself, that whatever may be our condition at this moment, the Lord will strengthen us. The Lord will stand by us. The Lord will hope hold us. And I decree to every life listening and watching, you will not die prematurely. The Lord will not allow strange death, sudden death, death that we put query in the heart of people that are, that are around you. Though God will not allow that in our lives and families in Jesus' name. With long life, we will live and the Lord will satisfy you. We will have long, healthy, productive, Fulfilled life in the name of Jesus. But then we know that Jesus can come at any time. And if can even call us home at any time, Lord, help us to always be prepared for eternity. Looking towards the kingdom of God so that in the end, we will see our Lord, our Savior, our Master, and our King. In Jesus' name, we are prayed. Amen. God bless you so much for joining me today. And some other times as we are led by the Lord, I will be doing one more video in this uh, series that will conclude this. Please, don't pray to die young. You will not die young. Do, do plan to live long. Make strategic plan for your future. But in all, be prepared for eternity at last. You see, if we can't see now, there's a place we're going to see. We'll see in heaven. And remember, Jesus calls us home, either by death or by the rapture. God bless you and keep blessing you. You can share this.